Hello everyone and welcome to the 16th Field Notes Live event. My name is Betsy Shrug and I'm a soil scientist in the St. Paul, Minnesota Regional Office and the Field Notes Regional Representative for the North Central Soil Survey Region. As Regional Representative, I serve on the Field Notes Review Committee. The Review Committee solicits and selects topics for each webinar. We have selected two exciting topics for you today and we encourage you to ask questions at any time using the Q&A panel. The Q&A panel should open by default. However, if for some reason your Q&A panel is not open, simply click on the question mark icon located on the right side of your screen. For closed captions, turn on the live caption button located in the lower right corner. Today's session is being recorded. Recorded sessions are available in Teams on the Field Notes channel and the National Soil Survey Center's YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy today's session. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jorge to tell you a little more about today's webinar. Jorge, take it away. So you're on mute, Jorge. Hey, sorry about that. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jorge Lugo sitting uh, for Dave Hoover, who is not able to to attend today's webinar. Today we have two great presentations and I don't want to spend any time on the introduction, so I would like to turn it to Dr. Behan Amishev, who is going to talk about soil sampling for carb soil carbon inventories. The floor is yours, Dr. Amishev. Thank you so much, Jorge. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, can uh, can you confirm that you can hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, we can my, hear you. Thank you. My name is Behan Amishev. Uh, I'm a soil scientist in the South Central Soil Survey region uh, in the Nacogdoches and Bryan, Texas MLRA office. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to present um, an important work on uh, carbon inventories uh, at this venue. Um, this work was done uh, some time ago and it was part of my doctorate program at Virginia Tech and the focus at the time was still uh, car soil carbon sequestration and ways to bring this uh, work to the public awareness. Um, the work was done on mine soils um, and before I delve into it, I, I want to spend a minute to um, explain what mine soils are. They are anthropogenic soils uh, created by uh, coal mine operating uh, companies after they mine the coal. And uh, this slide gives the typical progression of uh, mountains being mined for coal and then converted into uh, uh, a, a topography that resembles the original topography, but now we have mined soils. And in the top left picture, uh, you can see uh, the separation that happens during this process of what is available as uh, a topsoil material and weathered material that will include the A, B, C and R horizons and uh, the, the gray crushed rock that would be the overburden material which is also removed in order to get to the coal seams and, and these materials are, are put aside uh, until reclamation uh, commences. At the top right graph is one of the approaches of um, reclaiming the mine sites back to the original topography and uh, you can see the dozer here spreading the mixed topsoil materials and weathered overburden which is intended as the plant growth uh, medium after reclamation. Uh, if sites are reclaimed properly um, uh, they can be very productive as this is an example at the bottom right uh, picture showing eastern white pine at 18 years of age. Uh, the rationale of doing this work uh, was that there are hundreds of thousands of hectares across the US of coal mine land and these lands are usually considered to be empty cups in terms of carbon storage. Um, uh, 
to the left you can see in the soil profile this would be a, a typical young coal mine soil with a dark a horizon um, uh, and an ac darkened ac horizon uh, in the subsoil which are overlaying several sea horizons of varying degrees of compaction uh, however roots can grow throughout the soil profile uh, just following uh, the voids and um, uh, on the sides of course fragments uh, there are several challenges that uh, had to be overcome when we did this project uh, for soil carbon uh, measurements on coal mine lands, one being coal fragments in the soil that was uh, taken care of. Uh, uh, carbonates are also present. Um, what had to be addressed um, with more work and uh, this uh, uh, presentation tries to answer that is the sampling intensity and analysis costs and to see if we can actually produce carbon inventories at acceptable accuracy and precision uh, levels. The specific objectives were to answer three questions. Uh, where to dig? That would be to determine the horizontal distribution of sequestered carbon. Uh, how deep to dig? Uh, looking into the soil as a three-dimensional uh, unit, uh, how far down the soil profile is cost effective to dig? And then to determine how often to dig and that actually uh, implies understanding uh, the and determining the minimum detectable difference how long does it take for soil carbon to accumulate that we can uh, measure the difference the study area uh, for this particular project uh, span across uh, uh, three states in the Appalachian coal field and the mine sites range from one to nine years of age and that presented a good opportunity to see how carbon accumulates in, in these soils. Uh, soil samples were collected from the topsoil and the subsoil um, across several treatment um, experimental treatments that were set up for this project. The goal was to uh, try to determine how well uh, trees can be established on coal mine lands with the objective of increasing carbon in the soil. Uh, before I continue, though, I, I want to bring this up. Uh, it, it's a, it's an equation that everybody should have seen um, in any soils class of how do we estimate soil carbon, and there are quite a few parameters that go into understanding this uh, estimation. So the soil organic carbon per uh, surface area, that would be grams per square meter, uh, requires measurement of the carbon concentration. This would be the value that is produced in the lab. For the same horizon, bulk density of the finance is also required, as well as we need to know the volume percentage of the finds, which means uh, coarse fragments excluded. Uh, all of these are required per horizon. If there are many horizons down the soil profile, every individual horizon have to have, uh, has to have these values. Uh, these parameters are measured with some error and that have to be uh, also accounted for. Now moving on to another very important statistic, uh, semivariance modeling. Uh, we, we are uh, fortunate in this uh, day and age to have fast and capable computers and using imagery and so forth. Uh, and one of these uh, statistics that can help determine how things vary across space is the semivariance modeling, which basically means how similar are things that are close by and how dissimilar are things that are far away. Uh, one visual example of semivariance modeling would be to get a point data like the map on the left and convert this into a map that is very useful for decision making in terms of carbon sequestration uh, rates and targeting areas with high carbon sequestration and probably making different plans for those areas that are not as uh, prone to a higher rate of sequestration. Um, now, this was applied for the mine lands and again uh, the first set of results for the horizontal distribution uh, these values that i'm showing here meaning uh, that their spatial dependence 
uh, are useful to know how far between uh, sampling points one can afford to do the inventories. And for West Virginia, a four-year-old mine site that was at 590 meters. Uh, for the Ohio site being a nine-year-old site, it was still up to 575 meters of spatial dependence. Now, before I continue, I want to bring your attention to this slide and, and sort of have a look at the two, uh, uh, Ohio 1 and Ohio 3, two sites on the right-hand side of, of the map, and then the Ohio 2 at the bottom uh, there. Uh, they have very different rates of carbon sequestration. And this created a good opportunity to determine the difference uh, of sampling intensity. And, and this is what I want to uh, kind of bring, bring to your attention uh, for the rest of the slides. Uh, the sampling intensity, um, this would basically mean how many pits do we need per hectare to come up with a value that has a certain probability level precision and a certain accuracy level. The accuracy would be how far from the mean are we when we estimate the average of, let's say, four holes or 17 holes or 60 holes. Uh, what I've circled here on the left would be the number of pits on the Ohio 2 site with the lower soil organic carbon value and 17 pits will yield only a 95% probability level of precision at the 15% accuracy. If we really want accurate values, then we need to go to the highest 60 pit, but is that practical? Uh, probably not. So when inventories are planned, uh, one has to have these numbers, these uh, uh, an example table like this, uh, prior to commencing and prior to doing an inventory. Uh, on the other hand, for sites that have higher carbon sequestration, um, the sampling intensity, of course, is lower. So the two uh, graphs show this uh, compared very well. On the right hand side, we only need thir three plots or, or pits per hectare or 31 per 10 hectares and compared to the Ohio 2 site, which is almost three times higher. Now moving on to the next component of the vertical distribution of soil organic carbon and trying to answer those questions. What is the cost of maximum cost effective depth and the minimum detectable difference? Uh, these are profile graphs that many of us have seen um, and they're useful to understand how far carbon can accumulate down the soil profile. The graph to the right uh, is probably more informative in terms of answering a question, uh, where is the carbon or how deep do we have to dig the pits in order to account for most of the carbon? In this case, for the Ohio sites, uh, one third of the site, one third of the soil organic carbon will be uh, within the zero to 40 centimeter uh, profile. Two thirds will be down to 120 centimeters. But if we really want to account for all of the carbon, then we need to go down to two meters. But is that again, is that cost effective? Um, in order to determine the maximum cost effective depth, um, we converted the volume of the soil that is being excavated and analyzed, prepared and analyzed to uh, a value what would be the cost per soil pit, and then convert the value of the carbon that is being estimated for the sampling intensity into another value that would be the profit per ton of carbon. And the uh, numbers that I'm showing here, um, obviously they can change uh, annually, they can change by um, by country, they can change by project, uh, but, but just for this example, using $127 uh, per ton of elemental carbon and a cost of $8 per pit per centimeter, these values can be uh, put in, in such a way they can be estimated to determine the profit to cost ratio, uh, the column to the very right. And moving down the uh, 
the profile, uh, there would be a point, a limit, at which the profit to cost ratio would become less than one. And this ultimately means we're losing money. Although we want to account for all of the carbon across the profile, uh, it may not be cost effective, at least at this intensity that is required for the Ohio two side at 17 pits per hectare. If that can be reduced, just like the Ohio one and three sites, then we can most likely afford to do inventory for the full profile. And this is what this slide is showing. To the left, the limit of one is reached at 18 centimeters, but only 17% of the carbon can be inventory cost effectively. And then in the other two sites, um, it can be done cost effectively across the entire profile. The next uh, parameter to answer was the <clears throat> minimum detectable difference, and that would be the statistical signif statistically significant difference of two carbon values, one measured in the future, let's say in 30 years, and, an, and the other one would be the value measured today. Are they statistically different? The values that are being produced today they of course have an error estimate and that would be the uh, the confidence level of those values. So this is with the mean and then uh, with, with the green brackets here is the indication of the uncertainty of that value. Now when this is converted into um, the time that is required to sequester enough carbon into the future, uh, you'll have a graph similar to this to the right and I've turned it into a significant quote unquote years until future carbon inventory. What this means is that if we were to determine uh, carbon increase, significant statistically significant increase on the Ohio sites for a full profile down to 200 centimeters, then we need to wait for 40 years for carbon to accumulate enough that there is statistical significance between the two values. Um, and uh, for the Ohio 2 site, that is 32 years, but it's only down to 18 centimeters. Um, during this work, uh, uh, we also created a protocol of trying to help landowners who are willing to set up carbon sequestration projects on their uh, lands. And this protocol can also be applied for other ecosystems uh, where there is insufficient soil organic carbon data uh, or there is high variability in, in those ecosystems. Uh, one, one point that uh, I want to make with this slide is that uh, both uh, shallow pits as well as deep pits are needed when inventories are planned. We need to know the horizontal distribution and then also the vertical distribution. And equally important is when this will be repeated at certain uh, uh, periods into the future, every 30 years or so, then uh, it's a good idea to also set aside reserve plots. In the next few slides here, um, uh, I just want to summarize all this and, and let let it sink in. Um, again, the rule of thumb for anthropogenic soils um, is that they are uh, created and uh, uh, managed in, in, in by man, um, by people that have an, a task that has to be accomplished. However, they don't follow the rules of the rest of the world. And so we need to plan in a smart way how to sample, how to create um, uh, sampling inventory plans uh, that will reduce costs. So a good idea is to utilize all the tools available, statistical analysis being one. And the ideal scenario would be to target project areas with high soil organic carbon stocks and low variation. Uh, before any inventory is set up, uh, uh, it is highly recommended to have an idea of what the site uh, what, what are we dealing with on those sites and how deep and when to dig? So the MCD and the MDD parameters will be um, uh, helpful for, uh, with this decision. Um, for accounting uh, in the soils, there is another point that we can uh, improve on, and that would be the cost of sampling. Um, 
with new technologies uh, that are being available now in labs, uh, I, I want to mention the mid infrared spectrometry analysis. Um, this is uh, a new technology that we are in fact using in our own lab in Bryan, Texas to measure uh, soil organic carbon as well as eliminate uh, or, or know how much inorganic carbon there is. The cost can be reduced dramatically. Um, and so uh, this process can be uh, uh, improved so much that we can really account for the entire uh, soil profile and not just a limit to uh, surface uh, horizons. Um, a final conclusion slide is to remember that these projects like this are important to expand the public awareness uh, on climate change mitigation uh, uh, of these ecosystems, uh, be it on coal mine lands or uh, urban uh, settings where we have parks and trees and, and grasslands, uh, they all sequester. However, it's very important to understand also is that digging deeper does not equal higher profits from carbon credits, as well as digging sooner doesn't equal to faster return. So uh, th these are parameters that can help in decision making uh, for these inventories. Um, there were many people involved in this project uh, and I'm uh, grateful to have taken uh, part in this. Uh, with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I can take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yes, I'm, see, I'm seeing a few questions here in the chat. So uh, the first one, have there been experiments with mycelial inoculation on mine restoration sites to see if that improved tree recruitment and carbon accumulation? So, so is the question referring to does that help or? Yes, correct. Yes, if that improve. Yes. Yes, um, I, I know from uh, years back uh, when these sites are being reclaimed, uh, one way or at least the preferred way at the time was to hydro seed uh, the site so that the, the, the soil that is being placed on top of uh, the subsoil material is uh, secured. And so the grasses that are being established their purpose is to eliminate erosion and um, just keep the cover there. I know with the hydro seeds, there are some uh, um, uh, fertilizers as well as uh, mycelium inoculated seeds that are being used to make this a success. Uh, however, um, during my work um, uh, for, for this project, we really wanted to make sure that the grasses that are being planted for that initial purpose of keeping the soil uh, safe from erosion, that those grasses are not uh, exotic grasses and they can eventually give way to the trees that, that are coming in. So uh, although yes, they is use uh, in that regard, uh, but there's also a danger on the other hand of how aggressive these grasses can be since we want uh, the land can 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 revert back to it, the, the natural land use, uh, which would be uh, the native forest. I hope this answers the question. Thank you. I have another question here. Did you have the chance to classify the source on your study sites using soil taxonomy? Uh, no, not not at the time. We really had a focus on um, the the carbon accounting part. I know there's a push with anthropogenic soils um, uh, in this day and age, but uh, some time ago, uh, no, we did not. I don't see any other questions. Oh, there is one more that just popped up, Jorge. Yes, I see it. Okay. Did you compare carbon across different reclamation methods? Um, we uh, the the targets the study areas were on grasslands um, and and again the, the the reason for this uh, was 
because of the approach that was taken by the reclamation companies at the time to uh, to, to secure the sites and green them up, quote unquote, as fast as they can protect the sites. We, we didn't really have the luxury uh, or uh, uh, the choice between different reclamation uh, approaches. Um, my understanding is that uh, now there's a different requirement for the mining companies to follow. Uh, they they definitely uh, have to meet regulatory uh, policy and make sure that uh, uh, the sites are returned back to the same productivity as before. Um, some of the sites, uh, one, one project, in fact, the, the pictures that I'm showing here are from, a, from an eight-year-old mine site in Virginia, in the southwestern part of Virginia. And uh, th this, this site was uh, uh, previously used for uh, hunting, leasing. Um, uh, our goal was to essentially help uh, the owners of this site to determine if grasslands are just being left as they are uh, uh, accumulating enough carbon or should they revert to uh, planting trees and, and as you can see here there is some uh, trees that are coming in within the site uh, in eight years in fact uh, without any particular planting so uh, it will be something that is important to do to try to determine which reclamation uh, activities are better or not it just uh, some some time ago that was not uh, available to me. Thank you, Behan. I don't see any other questions. So before moving to the next uh, presentation, I would like to uh, Give the announcement to please save the date for the next next webinar on September 13, 2022. If you have a good work that you would like to share with everybody, please work with your supervisors or your regional directors so you can be a next presenter. Our next presenter is Austin Price from the Rally Hemelory office, and he's going to talk about Reclamation, restoration, and the, the coastal zone soil survey project. Austin, the floor is yours. Alrighty, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as Jorge said, uh, my name is Austin Price. Uh, I'm a soil scientist in Raleigh, North Carolina, and today I'll be presenting on uh, Lake Matamuski reclamation restoration in the coastal zone soil survey um, this field work was done uh, the week of may 23rd uh, we traveled out to lake matamuskie which is in hyde county north carolina and then the cores were cracked on june 6th and 7th of 2022 um, just going to give you a little background on uh, the location of Lake Matamuskie. Uh, lake Matamuskie is the largest, the largest natural lake in North Carolina. Uh, there are no underwater springs or headwaters feeding the lake. Um, the lake's bed is the lowest point in Hyde County and is at three to five feet lower than the sea. Um, so <clears throat> Lake Matamuskie is located in MLRA 135B. Uh, this area is nearly level across the coastal plain um, as shallow valleys uh, meandering stream channels and most of these valleys terminate into estuaries along the coast um, uh, <clears throat> Lake Matamuskie is consistent or consists of about uh, 50,000 acres and it's about 18 miles long and seven miles wide uh, why Lake Matamuskie was picked for coastal zone mapping uh, it's kind of the first of its kind, um, being a large freshwater, freshwater body. It has a unique history of human alteration, and uh, we're helping the U.S. Fish and Wildlife aid in restoration of the lake. Uh, so to continue on the history of Lake Matamuskie, uh, in 1837, the first canal was built. 
Uh, the total length of this was about seven miles long. And on the right hand side, uh, this is the first canal that was built and it was uh, seven miles long and it was dug by hand. And once this first canal was uh, built, the lake drained from 120,000 acres to 55,000 acres. And then over the next 75 years, other canals were added to the lake to bring it to its modern day size of about 50,000 acres. Um, in 1909, the drainage district of Lake, Ma or the Matamuskie drainage district um, was formed. And then in the lower right hand corner, you can uh, see the plans for draining the lake. Um, after the drainage district canals were placed, um, or actually they were placed at 1.5 miles intervals and they would flow to the pumping station which is at located at the most southern point on uh, that map where it says the town of new holland um, since the lake bed was below sea level the district uh created these canals to carry fresh water to the pamlico sound which is uh further south of uh wysockings bay um Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and the pumping plant uh, actually lifted the water, uh, had to lift the water higher due to the lake being uh, being in a depression. Um, also, the pumping station uh, was built in 1915 after many years of um, fighting in the drainage district. They finally decided or finally finished the uh, pumping station. At one time, the pumping station was the largest pumping plant in the world that would drain and reclaim to what many at the time to believe, many at the time believed to be the richest soil in America. Um, the pumping plant was capable of moving about 1.2 million gallons of water per minute. Um, to put that in perspective, it's about the same amount of water that goes over Niagara Falls every 16 seconds. So it's a uh, it's quite a lot, and this pumping station was uh, steam powered, um, and then the lake was dry or drained and reclaimed three times in 1916, 1920, and 1926, and then 1926 it kept the the lake dry for the next five years, and then in 1932 pumping stopped. Um, the pumping stopped due to the siltiness of the soils on the bottom of the lake. Uh, at one time, they had four dredgers running uh, 12 hours a day to keep the pump running efficiently and uh, <clears throat> allowing sh uh, coal ships to navigate the channels without running into uh, uh, silt bars just from the uh, large amount of drainage that was going on. And after the large amount of effort and the price to keep the lake dry, pumping stopped. Um, and then in 1909, when uh, the, when uh, the ground was subaerial, so it was not wet, um, it was mapped by the Bureau of Soils, which is predating the SCS. Um, a majority of the lake bed is le uh, mapped as Matamuski, so it's a soil series named after its after the lake uh, it is no longer in use due to it being a subaerial soil and Lake Matamuski now being a subaqueous soil or a subaqueous area. Um, but the soil was, it's a teric haplosaprist, which means it's a histosol with a layer of mineral soil material 30 centimeters or more within the upper boundary. Uh, now I'm gonna go to present history to where the lake starts to get refilled. Um, in 1934, the U.S. government uh, took over the running of Lake Matamuskie, and since 1934, um, the U.S. government has owned the lake and has and created the Lake Matamuskie Migratory Waterfall Waterfowl Refuge. And during the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps removed all the pumping equipment and turned the pumping station, which was on the first slide into a 
a lodge. And in 2007, the lodge was transferred over to the North Carolina Wildlife uh, Resource Commission for the state to take over and reclaim Lake Matamuski. And then 2017, the uh, state developed a watershed restoration plan. Uh, this plan aims to address uh, ways to protect the life of the life in Hyde County, restore the water quality, and actively manage rising water levels. Um, the biggest thing they're having uh, trouble with is restoring the water quality. Um, the subaquatic vegetation in Lake Matamuski has been diminishing, which is this graphic right here. And around 2013, uh, I'll, that's when the carp population, so that's at the bottom, uh, it's the common carp, which is an invasive species in the uh, in North America, and this <clears throat> uh, the largest decline for the SAV is just from the common carp. They uh, create turbid conditions by going into the uh, bottom of the lake and ripping up SAV, and then taking um, lake sediments and then putting them back into the water column, which then can cause a algal bloom and introduce uh, eutrophication. And then to go to, uh, so this is subaqueous mapping. This is a preliminary map we did before we went out uh, on the on the lake. Um, when we were out there, we we're using a pontoon boat and an airboat, which I will show in uh, future slides. Um, so when we started this, we talked to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and there's two different uh, color stars on there. So the yellow is for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for sediment plumes. So they just wanted to get some cores out there while we we're out there to see what we thought of the areas they were looking into. And then the red are for the NRCS to see if our mapping is a uh, relatively accurate. Uh, the mapping scale is 1 to 12,000. Um, and the contours for the landforms were made at uh, 10 centimeter breaks just because the lake is so shallow and we wanted to try to be as accurate with it as we could. Um, a majority of the lake or the majority of the middle of the lake is a bay bottom which is just it's it's the deepest part of the lake so it's it's pretty sandy there not a lot of um sediments transported there or settles out there um and then the eastern side of the lake is a wave cut platform so it's just from winds going from west to east creating uh small waves in the lake and then cutting down the profile of the size or cutting the um the soil on the coast and depositing it into the lake uh, so now I'm just going to go over coring and cracking. Uh, this is the one of the boats we actually brought out to Lake Matamuski. This is an airboat. And then on the airboat on the left side is Dean Shields, who is our in-house photographer for the Southeast region for soil scientists. And uh, on the right hand side is Greg Taylor. And before we went out on the boat, we we're just checking over everything, making sure uh, we got gas, fuel, all the uh, tools and so forth, because the closest gas station was about an hour and a half away. Um, actually, during this trip, we did have uh, thrown out the gas station due to uh, not having enough fuel in the airboat, and that kind of set us back a day. Um, the next photo is, this is our uh, soil intern, Chris Mackey. Um, this is the Rose Bay Canal at Lake Matamuski, and the canal there is only about, uh, 30 feet so launching the airboat was not uh, as difficult as the pontoon boat and our pontoon boat is about 24 feet so it's it's pretty narrow where we were um, until we got out into the lake uh, so <clears throat> this is once we pulled the cores off the boat which we used these uh, large aluminum pieces of pipe for so we'd drive them into the ground and then pull them out with uh, with a block and tackle on the on the front of the airboat. Well, I guess that's a winch. Uh, but on the pontoon boat, we have a block and tackle. But once we got
got all the cores, uh, we would crack them. So this is actually Ruben Wilson in the uh, in the green shirt, and he is using a pair of uh, pipe shears to cut open the core. And we would do this on both sides and then run guitar string through it to cut open the uh, soil. And then we can we can uh, do a description based on that. And then Chris Mackey is just pulling the excess aluminum so uh, it doesn't get jammed up in the shears. So um, from left to right, the left is uh, Lori Graninsky, uh, myself in the middle, and then Chris Mackey is all the way on the right. So as we saw in the last photo of Ruben and Chris cutting the core, that's what the core comes out to be once it is cut and run guitar string through it. So we lay it out, we take a photo of it beforehand, and then we will do a description. Uh, on to subaqueous mapping. Um, <clears throat> after pulling the cores and cracking them, uh, we just wanted to reconfigure our landforms based on what we saw. Um, a big takeaway from what we learned about the lake is it's a lot less diverse in soils than we thought, um, but it's more interesting. For example, in the uh, northwestern corner, uh, there's this light blue and this sea of dark blue. It's actually settled organics while we were out there. Um, we just believe that the settled organics are just saved over there because you don't get too much uh, uh, waves and so forth on the on the western shore. So it could, they kind of settled out. And then slide nine, these are just the soils of the lake. Uh, all the way on the left is actually the OSD pedon for the Bellhaven. Um, there is evidence of humiluvic materials across the whole um, the whole lake. As you can see in the uh, the Bellhaven, so the most left and most left uh, pedon is uh, the BHSE horizon. Um, and then uh, the humic, hum, humiluvic meaning is just organic soils that are acid and have been drained and cultivated. So these were drained and cultivated uh, almost about 100 years ago. So they do meet the classification for that. And a majority of these uh, pedons have a sea horizon at the top. Um, this is just most likely from when the lake was getting refilled. Um, sediment got transported and set on top sides in the middle, which this middle bed on is actually from the the uh, settled organics area. Um, it's the only histosol out there, but the the sands are put up just from transport or transport uh, transportation. I'm sorry, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to email myself, uh, Ruben Wilson, or uh, Dean Shields. Thank you.